Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Ah, so fast. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All good. Okay. On awesome. So I see more folks are joining. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Happy May 2021. We've made it um, to our next Glass Reflections conversation. And as we begin, feel free to type in the chat hello or tell us where you're visiting from. It's always fun to see where folks are. Um, and as you all get settled in, um, oh, great, from Germany. <laughs> uh, my name is Jenna. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Operations and Programs Manager for the Glass Art Society. So to those who have been to one of these conversations before, welcome back. And to those who may be new, Glass Reflections is an ongoing virtual program where I interview glass artists, businesses, educators, hello from LA, um, and anyone else in the glass community on how they explore glass as a vehicle for self-care and um, how we can shed light on the resiliency of glass artists, especially through the lens of how we can cultivate sustainable art careers. Um, oh, yay, Mexico, all over the place. So excited to see you all. Um, today, I am very excited to be joined by interdisciplinary art, artist, excuse me, Casey J. Swidinski, who received a BA from the University of North Florida and an MFA from the University of Louisville. She was the 2008 recipient of the Mary Alice Hadley Prize for Visual Art and spent part of the year traveling to do research at the Holocaust Center and the Jewish Contemporary Museum in San Francisco, which sounds awesome. KCJ is also the co-founder and executive director of Project Chance, which is a nonprofit that raises and trains service dogs for children with autism and other disabilities. So welcome, KCJ. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you would like to add about who you are, your background, or interests? I know that was a very condensed bio as to who you are. It was It was great. Um, I think um, on a more personal note, I thank you for having me. I'm super excited to see people from all over the world. That's really exciting and some people that I know. <laughs> and I just want to say that I really was drawn to this series someone who's living with generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder, and who's been sober for 15 years, I really appreciate the focus of this series, um, especially after grad school, coming out of grad school into a pandemic, into a, um, I just think that's so um, timely. So I'm like so thrilled to be here. Thank you, that's so great to hear. Um, yeah, it's still, I'm also thinking of we haven't quite hit a year of this type of programming. So there's been a lot of learning and I'm excited to see that there is such an interest in this type of programming and just having more conversations around artists and how you can have these wonderful art careers where you are juggling maybe five to 10 or 20 different projects at once, but it, it's important to how you take care of yourself in order to, to be a thriving human. Absolutely. Um, so to get things started for our conversation today, um, could you maybe explain your relationship with glass and gas? Gas and glass. <laughs> um, so I have been a member of gas since probably 2016. Um, I, when I started grad school, I think I joined, it might have been a little bit before that, um, but I was also the student liaison for two years from 2017 to 2019 at um, the University of Louisville. Um, and I have been, I felt really supported um, by GAS and found um, community there. I've been in two of the member exhibitions online, the student Yay. exhibition, uh, Northwest Refract um, exhibition. I did a member spotlight. Um, and a lot of that was like me reaching out and like being like the organization felt really responsive and receptive. And so, um, yeah, it's been it's been great. I think that's uh, gas is great uh, for the community. Oh, that's so great to hear. Yeah, I noticed, especially I feel in the past year or so, you have really stepped up into the spotlight. And I, speaking of, saw your member spotlight, which was amazing. We're actually going to touch on that 
particular piece in a little bit. Um, and then even for the virtual 21 gas conference that we have coming up, you're also included in that virtual exhibition. So it's been great to have you be represented in multiple ways. And for others who are interested, always feel free to reach out to us. Um, we love to highlight what folks are doing in our community. Then that being said, um, sorry, I got slightly distracted by something that popped on the screen. Um, getting more to glass specifically as a medium, how did that relationship begin? And what drew you to glass as a medium? So uh, where I went to undergrad at the University of um, North Florida, there was no glass. I think I had seen it in like, you know, Williamsburg or something where they do the, you know, but I didn't really think about it. And then in 2007, I went to Penland School of Craft for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I was in the printmaking studio taking a Phil Sanders lithography class. And right up the hill, there was a studio that was lit at all hours of the night and day. And there was always music and laughter coming down the hill. I was like, what are they doing up there? And so I wandered up there and it was the glass shop. And I was like, I just want to be in this space. Like mm -hmm. there's so much, um, it's so alive, you know, the printmaking studio was like very, you know, <laughs> head down, you know, um, and it just was, a, it was an environment that I wanted to be in. And then I started to meet people. And um, I think when I got uh, home, I took a class at Jacksonville University. It was like one of the hobby classes where they're like, anything you make, they're like, great job, you did it, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. It doesn't even matter what it is, you know? And I think that after that, I was like seeking more constructive um, and instructive spaces to learn. And so I took some uh, classes at Penland and then took a concentration at Penland and then uh, I was looking at grad schools where I could do an interdisciplinary program. Glass is not my only focus. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I always, I love the community and I wanted to be part of it. So I just kind of slowly found mm -hmm. ways to um, be in that, be in that space. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love to hear how people kind of found their way to this community. Cause once you do it, at least my experience thus far is that it's been very welcoming and opening and kind of that um, socializing type of, atmosphere, which I think is fun. Yeah. Um, so then talking more about your art practice, um, I always find it really interesting the way that different artists approach their artist statement and kind of what they try to explore within their work. So a piece that I would love to kind of sift through with you a little bit is how you say that your practice questions the authenticity of history and perception. You're interested in both what and how we remember and how information is passed to successive generations. You also probe familial narratives and establish power structures to consider methods of introduction. And then you also ask this interesting question of how do we choose what to embrace or deny from our inherited legacies? How do these choices manifest intergenerationally to shape belief and identity? And so as you hear this now, how does that all sit with you, especially given how much things have changed and shifted within this past year? I'm out of someone else's mouth, it sounds like a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like, um, it sounds very academic, but basically <laughs> I'm interested in how we choose what to believe in our lives. Because a lot of the time we're all indoctrinated into systems, whether it's, um, so to give concrete examples of what this sort of really esoteric language means is um, I did a lot of uh, research into the Holocaust um, in graduate school. Um, and there are many examples of systems, uh, political, familial, religious, we're all indoctrinated into some type of social or cultural system. And then we also have lived experience. And there's a tension often between that lived experience and those indoctrinated experiences. Mm -hmm in like the tension between the two um and so when i hear this now it feels um it still feels incredibly relevant given the um issues with systemic racism that have gone on um and the politics that have happened over the trump presidency i feel like now more than ever there's a polarization and a binary between people and politics and it's hard sometimes to sift between truth opinion and falsehood 
even when you're looking. And so like the idea of the question and really like being able to hold space for the question is also something that's really important to me. So when I think about how do we choose what to believe, you know, do we believe the things that we were taught growing up? Is that like, what's right or do we, be like, how do we choose what to believe and like, what do we take as, as our own truth, you know? Um, so it feels really relevant to me still, um, especially with COVID as well, because there's a lot of, um, like, that's a whole nother thing, right? So it, it, it yeah. adds a whole um, another like relevancy to what like I'm interested in, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that just this past year, COVID being one of the layers, but then there are all these other layers that one has to take into account, like the current political framework or structure, because even that is different in different countries and such. Um, so I think you pose a really interesting question. And within that, I'm curious if your idea or exploration of um, indoctrination, especially like right now, how that might have shifted given all of the virtual landscape that we're now kind of living in. Um, I think in some ways it's, um, you know, even, even more challenging, um, because you can find any news source or site to support your point of view. You can, mm -hmm. or search requests into a, you know, um, internet search engine, what you put in can even tailor like the results you get back for what you search for. So in regards to like trying to find information um, virtually, I think that, um, it's, it's more challenging than ever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's challenging too when you have, like with COVID, um, what's fact and what is fact driven by uh, political parties agenda. Like that's crazy that you have to sift mm -hmm. through all of that just to find information, you know, but that's what it feels like these days. So I feel like it's very challenging. So um, I also feel like if you question, sometimes you are, if you even try to embody the other side by asking questions, maybe not because you're like agreeing with this, the other side, but sometimes you can even be sort of shamed for, for trying to understand the other side, right? When it's really just, if you're trying to be a skeptic or a critic and be like, hey, are we all like, let's think about this critically. Even trying to have a conversation and raising the question can be, so sometimes within this framework of being having a difficult time trying to find information, sometimes you can't even talk to people about it because they're like, oh my God, how can you even, how can you even ask that, you know? So I think it's doubly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that thinking critically part is really important and sometimes gets put to the side a little bit, especially when emotions or things get heated. And I think artists in particular are able to explore critical thinking in a really unique and interesting way. And so one of the ways that you kind of explore this, and I want to touch on, so a couple of your pieces that I was just drawn to when I was exploring your website, um, which is saccharine shrines. And so for those who maybe are here and haven't seen it before, can you maybe visually describe what that piece is? Sure. Um, so it's, it looks like a stained glass window. It's an arch and it has circular um, panels. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's made from sugar. So if anybody has seen old movies where they break a bottle over someone's head or they like punch mm -hmm. them, so it used to be, it used to be made from sugar. Like you can boil sugar to a hard crack and it becomes like caramel basically. And if you take it off right before it turns oral, um, you can pour it and it's, it's clear. And so, you know, you've probably had a dessert where they drizzle it across, you know, but anyway, so I made, mm -hmm. I, uh, forged, uh, out of steel, these circular shapes and then put them in an arch and then I, uh, masked them off and poured sugar in them. So it looks like glass. But over time, the humidity starts to set in and they like do this really great, like slumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, there's one image of um, one of those like slumping and then it looks like someone's tongue is like about to touch it, which is one of the photos that we had used for the member spotlight. 
So, yep. oh, I recognize that. Is that glass? Mm -hmm. Not exactly, but it looks and resembles glass, which I found really interesting. Um, so within that whole series, you say that um, it exists at the intersection of belief and consumption with implications toward ex extant systemic power structures. That was a tongue twister for me. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit more on, on that aspect? Sure. Um, so when I was in grad school, a lot of my work was looking at this idea of inherited legacies and the tension mm -hmm. between dogma and lived experience. After grad school, um, I was interested in working with some of these same core concepts um, that exist within that. Like how do we navigate that? What do we choose to believe? What happens when you look at systems of indoctrination? Um, but I also wanted to try and get away from Judaism because I don't know that I want to be known as like the Jewish artist, you know, my whole career. Um, so it interests me, but I do think that there's like some accessibility issues for people entering work that's about Judaism because there just is, right? It's not going to be for everybody, which is fine because that work's important. I also want to make maybe some different work. So I was thinking about, um, you know, different inherited legacies. And I had done a body of work about the Holocaust. I had done a body of work about um, the Jewish commentaries. And um, I wanted to look at consumption and consumerism within um, sort of American culture. And so the way that I did it was I chose to work with, this, with stained glass windows. Um, so stained glass windows historically served as a means of education for the illiterate during the medieval times when people couldn't read a lot of people couldn't read. Um, the stained glass windows would tell the story of the Bible, you know? And so, so it was actually like this method of control for the church. Um, so stained glass windows that are from sugar sort of implicate a culture that preaches from an early age that consumption is an almost whole mm -hmm. culture. Um, we're sold by the media, you know, like you can buy life. All you need is to consume more, consume more goods, consume more things, and and then you'll be fulfilled and you'll be happy, you know. So it's likening consumerism to sort of this holy endeavor. Sugar mm -hmm. windows. <laughs> yeah. Is fascinating and actually stained glass is one of the um, groups within the general glass community that I've become really interested in in this past year and I think there's to lack of a better phrase like a renaissance of the like potential of yes what stained glass can do and communicate so curate a stained glass show because it's like everybody's doing it everybody from like Nino to grandma is like doing <laughs> right now and I'm so interested in like I I also feel there's been a renaissance post COVID or during COVID mm -hmm. totally I also have been super interested in it mm -hmm. so then shifting gears so slightly you started to talk about it and I want to explore some of those um, earlier works that kind of touch on Judaism and that part of your identity in particular because there are several pieces in that series um, but focusing on this work called The Impossibility of Historical Renaissance Two, And so for that one, could you also give a little visual description of what that piece is? Sure, it's, and it's the impossibility, impossibility of historical resonance. Oh, you're right, I just read that incorrectly, yes. No, I only think, well, I only correct you because I think it makes a difference to the, to the understanding of the work. Um, sure, so uh, I love books, I love books. Um, so this uh, series I did, uh, and the larger series is called Ordeal of the Bitter Water. So it takes one of the books from the Talmud. So if people don't know, there's the Torah, which is like the Old Testament. And there's two parts. There's a, there's a written and an oral component. And basically the oral component was never supposed to be written down. The written component was down so that it wasn't lost and it's like a cipher of how to read the um, oral part because it's there's no punctuation there's no vowels it can be interpreted in any number of ways mm -hmm. so that's already this sort of lots of interpretations of possible then there's the Talmud which consists mm -hmm. of two books the Mishnah and the Gemara and basically they're all commentaries on what's come before so the Jewish series of commentaries covers a thousand years and it's rabbis going over what's come before. It's rabbis arguing. It's thousands of people <laughs> arguing and they're all men. So this one- Quite a visual. <laughs> yeah. 
So this one, this one tractate, which is like a chapter of books about family law is called Sota. A Sota is a woman whose husband believes her guilty of adultery. The whole book is talking about the trial that the husband and the um, rabbi are to do to this woman. And it's humiliating to the woman. So they drag her to the temple, they cut her hair, they take off her clothes, they make her drink water from the temple floor. And it's this whole thing. And so with this series, I was thinking a lot about what do you do with problem histories or things that are really hard to access from this point in history. So the actual work is uh, screen printed and fused sheet glass that has the narrative from this book screen printed on the pages. The pages are then fused and then they're rebound within the book. So it looks like a book from the side if you close it. And then when you open it, you can kind of see the narrative, but you can't really open the pages and you can just sort of glean some of the words here and there. Mm -hmm. It sounds amazing. And so when in person, are people able to like interact with this book or is it pretty, is it just like a sculptural piece that people can observe? So the way I've um, exhibited, exhibited it before is where you could open the front part mm -hmm. and then the rest is heavy. So it just stays there but people can open the front flap and see the pages. Mm -hmm. That sounds cool. I would love to see it in person one day. Um, so then with this piece, um, there was one thing I wanted to also explore with you of the transparent nature of glass to reference the layered and complicated nature of historical recollection. And you, you've been touching on this um, a bit throughout like our conversation today. But how do you think that the medium of glass can kind of speak to this unique way of recording and then sharing either relationships or legacy or just storytelling in general? I think glass as a medium lends itself really, uh, really well to the idea of palimpsests, which is this um, Palimpsest is something that is reused or altered, but still bears the visible traces of its earlier form. So good examples are like old um, vellum manuscripts where mm -hmm. the vellum was more important than what was written on it. So they would reuse them. They'd like write on a, a vellum manuscript and then they would erase it and then they'd use it again. So there's still, and so a lot of, um, a lot of old uh, manuscripts were actually recovered that way by like going back and tracing oh. Um, but it's this really neat idea, right? Because there's, you can have like this idea of like temporal palimpsest or architectural palimpsest, like something that bears a bit of what came before, right? And so I think that glass is the ability to do this really well um, because mm -hmm. it can be, um, it can be layered and the transparency can be manipulated to sort of reference mm -hmm. these ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And also like when thinking about history, right? Like history is sort of this temporal palimpsest, right? It's like one moment stacked on top of another moment and then recorded for posterity. And in the case of the Jewish commentaries, it's recorded by men, right? And so, mm -hmm. so like, what do, what do you do with that? And also there's like a lot of great things in the book too, because there's like ways for living well and treating your, your, I mean, there's so many good things that are also within the dogma and there are problematic things, right? And so that <laughs> is pretty interesting to me. Yeah, I find that interesting as well. And I think just, just mm, personal opinion, kind of the nature of, of human beings, kind of that duality of problematic, but then also there's something to be learned or gleaned from. Um, and I want to, so it sounds like a lot of, at least this series and some of your other works touch on research and knowledge you have of Judaism and that religion. Is there other types of research or... Um, like other practices that inform your artwork and your artistic practice? Yeah, I mean, I would say like research definitely is a big part of my practice. Um, when it came to grad school, it was really heavily research-based because I was learning mm -hmm. about Judaism that I didn't know. I grew up Jewish-ish, like <laughs> part of my family was Jewish and part was Catholic. And I, so mm -hmm. I have guilt from both religions. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, I, I like knew some things, but both have a lot of dogma. Both have a lot of like ceremony and ritual, like things that are good and also things that are like so archaic, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I did do a lot of research. I went to the Jewish Contemporary Museum. I went to the Holocaust Center. 
um, I did do a lot of, took a lot of classes um, in school about Jewish history and literature and film. Um, and then also I would say because I'm an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary artist and I'm not married to one um, process or material, a lot of the times I am having to learn something that I don't know. So even when it comes to process and techniques, I feel like even that, even that part of my practice is research heavy because oftentimes I'm learning as I go or I'm like seeking out something specifically to make a piece that maybe I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain process or medium that you've been exploring recently in your practice? Yeah, I have been working on actually stained glass <laughs> techniques. Ah. So I uh, just recently had a, a residency in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I was working on a series of broken and mended mirrors. So I was breaking mirrors and then mending them using stained glass techniques. And I had never done it before. I had done this thing that was akin. It was like stained glass adjacent, but mm -hmm. I had never done stained glass and I was really interested in it. So now I'm starting to get into actual stained glass and I'm learning it because I had never done it. Nice. So can't wait to see what those end up looking like. Yeah. Uh, so shifting gears just slightly, because um, there's this whole other part of you that I just find really fascinating, which is your nonprofit work and your nonprofit life. Yeah. Um, so Project Chance, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about what this organization does and the folks that you serve? Sure. Um, this is something that's really close to my heart. Uh, so my mom and I uh, founded Project Chance in 2008. And we use white golden retriever um, to help with uh, children with autism. And our we generally work with children from four to twenty-one. We have also trained service dogs for other invisible disabilities. I have a service dog um, for panic attacks and vertigo assistance. Um, I've also trained service dogs for um, bipolar disorder, for um, cerebral palsy, for muscular dystrophy, and I think that's mostly it, but, um, but our, our that umbrella, it's mostly um, service dogs for kids with autism. That is amazing. And do you know, do, are many of these dogs in any hot shops or do they experience any glass on the regular? So my dog, um, Ido, has been in more glass shops than I have because um, my partner is a glass blower and has worked all over um, Seattle mm -hmm. and he would take her to work sometimes when I was at Pilchuck. And so she's been to almost all the shops between he and I in the Seattle area. So I know there's, I don't know of any others that are in hot shops. Um, although we are working with a client in New York that will end up being in a fabric studio. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Oh, what an interesting just organization and way to, to help folks. Um, I'd be curious to hear also about you and how you take care of yourself in addition to your lovely dog that I'm sure is there all the time. Um, He's what types of practices love that, do you integrate into your own practice? Um, I, you know, for me, because I have sort of always had to maintain a really big awareness of like w how my body is in the world. Um, so it's, it's like the basic things are really important. So sleeping, um, eating, drinking water, working out, like all of those basic things that a body needs are actually like really important as the bare minimum. Like in times of crisis, I'm like, those are the things I focus on because right. That's the thing. I also rely on um, medication, you know, over Pandemic, I had a pretty bad time and my anxiety was out of control. And so I got onto an antidepressant for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think from like, so that's like, right, that's physicality wise. That's like what I do with my body. I like try and take care of my physical body. Mm -hmm. um, because if it runs well, then like, you know, a lot of the times I can work on my head. Um, and then I also think too, since I've been out of since I've been out of school, like, I've been thinking about what it means to have a sustainable practice because in grad school, um, grad school was this really, really uh, crazy pace. You know, you're working like just this crazy out, you know, and it's transformational, incredible, but it's not sustainable for term creative practice. So I think too, one of the things that I've been learning in the past two years, um, COVID forced this 
with a like mm -hmm. hard is slowing down and like knowing that there's an effort and an ease within a long-term creative practice. Like sometimes you're going to be going hard and sometimes you're not going to be working on art because you're working on this thing over here. Right. And so it's like trying to balance family and your mental health and friends and commitments and work that pays the bills and work that stimulates your soul. And it's like knowing that like the pie chart has to be more evenly divided mm -hmm. um, because if not now, you know, so like sort of being okay with like maybe a slower pace, I think, um, is one of the things I'm learning. Like I have to do all those things to have a healthy practice. That's amazing. Thank you for all of that. And I really want to highlight that, that piece of balance and, um, kind of slowing down and being okay with that. And I also would just like to uplift and thank you for your generosity and vulnerability of, you know, your mental health. And I think that's a really important conversation for, for folks to have. And I think it's starting to become more comfortable in at least this part of the world or society to have those conversations about what, what you need and, and being just transparent with that. So that's amazing. Thanks for that. Um, is there other practices that you do that um, to make you feel whole and well that you can maybe showcase to some of the folks that are here today? Yeah, so I was thinking about this like when we were talking earlier. And so I was thinking about one of the um, breathing techniques that also incorporates your physical body. Because a lot of the times when I would have an anxiety attack, it was this like... Um, my body doesn't feel right in space and I am having this like dissociative, these dissociative moments. So like connecting breath to body was like a really big thing. So um, I'll show you and I'll like speak you through it and I'll do a few rounds. And if you want, that's fine. Um, so basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be breathing in and out to the count of five and we're going to be incorporating um, the touch. So uh, you'll be doing squeezing your fingers as you count to five. So you breathe in, one, two, three, four, five, pause at the top, and then you work back down to the rest of the fingers. Four, three, two, one, pause, breathe out, breathe in, two, three, four, five, pause at the top, breathe out, four, three, two, one, pause, up. breathe in, two, three, four, five. And then you can switch hands and mm. go the other hand. And so I always found that like flowing the, I can't remember if it's the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system, but there's the one that like amps up when you have anxiety. And so having that pressure, the compression on your fingers mm. and having something to focus on and something to do with your hands was a way to like try and get out of that anxiety brain mm -hmm. um, or ice cubes in your palm that is also a good one <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah for sure so that i haven't come across the squeezing and compression of the fingers one i do know it's a traditional technique within um yoga and pranayama which is a breathing practice to to count by just oh bringing your fingers to one thumb the finger pads um but I liked integrating like both of your hands in something to like bring it back to yourself. Yeah. Um, so hopefully folks found that interesting and helpful. It also is interesting and just like a practice in and of itself to be able to breathe in for like a five breaths. I know at first, like it feels almost a little bit challenging of like, Oh, I'm like out of breath at count of three. So I found that also interesting in a whole breathing practice. Yeah, it makes you really learn to like regulate because if you inhale too fast, mm -hmm. in three, you're like, uh, right. And so yeah. by the second round, you figure out like, if I have to incorporate a breath like on a bellows from inhale, pause, exhale, right, you begin to have to mindfully sort of navigate where your breath falls on that five count, you know, mm -hmm. so it like makes you conscientiously deeper slow breaths because you're like oh if I get to three I'm like out of breath I, br I was breathing in too fast mm -hmm. a very mindful way to like make you pay attention to the speed of your you know 
yeah, that self-regulation piece I think is really helpful, especially during really stressful times mm -hmm. as I'm sure many of us are still in. So hopefully folks can try that in your studio or in your home space and you find some comfort from it. So thank you for sharing with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Awesome. So I just am checking the time. We are over slightly, but is there anything else you would like to share with those who are here live or for those who watch the recording later? I want to give you the platform as well. Yeah, no, I just, um, gosh, it was a great conversation. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Great. So thank you all for joining us today and for KCJ for sharing your story and all the information about yourself. Um, very much appreciated. This program is going to be uploaded to the GAS platform soon and will include KCJ's information. If you'd like to reach out, check out the website that has all those beautiful artworks. Um, and we hope that we all can see you later this month for the virtual 2021 conference. We're super excited to have our exhibitions with artists such as KCJ and all of our live and pre-recorded presentations. So thank you all again and see you later this month and next month for our next class reflections. Thank you so much everybody and thank you Jenna. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>